Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is Matt Chat episode 406, uh, featuring the first in a new series of uh, historical retrospectives uh, that will accompany the book Dungeons and Desktops 2.0 uh, that I've been currently working on. Uh, anyway, I thought it'd be fun to play some of these games with you, show you what it's all about, give you an appreciation for these different eras, as I call them, uh, of computer game, uh, computer role-playing game history. And this first uh, installment, we'll be talking about some uh, games from the Bronze Age, or uh, games that came out right when the first home computers launched. Uh, so we're looking at late 70s, early 80s, uh, Apple II, the Commodore PET, uh, a computer called the X80 Sorcerer, as uh, well as the uh, TRS-80. Uh, we'll be looking at this era, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. I'll give you some ideas of uh, where this genre came from, uh, how far we've come, but also how far ahead of their time uh, some of these games were. It's remarkable stuff. Uh, so in this uh, first installment, we'll be looking at uh, a Calabath uh, by Lord British. Uh, we'll look at the, <laughs> the Tarturian. Uh, <laughs> Uh, just to let you see what that one's all about. Uh, we'll look at Wizard's Castle and Amon. I uh, see these are all really interesting games. Uh, so without further ado, here is the Bronze Age Part 1. All right, folks, and here we go. We're going to start off with the most well-known of these Bronze Age games, namely uh, Calabeth uh, by none, or, none other than the great Lord British himself, Richard Garriott. Awesome dude, the J.R.R. Tolkien of the CRPG, as I like to think of him. And this is his first commercial game. Now, it's not his first game. Uh, he did something like 27, maybe 30 games before this. Little things. Uh, he didn't sh He didn't try to sell those. Uh, but he actually still has all of them <laughs> sitting around his place. He archives all his stuff. I mean, he's really... It's, uh, he's got massive archives. I'd love to get in there one day and see it all. Uh, but anyway, this is his first game. Certainly not his best. I mean, obviously, he's just getting started here. He's working at basic. Uh, that said, though, uh, when you compare this to some of the other games we'll be looking at, you'll see just... I mean, the guy was already far ahead of the, <laughs> the competition. <laughs> uh, as amazing as that is. But anyway, early 80s, uh, Apple II. Uh, you probably wouldn't come across this game. I don't think the distribution was all that great. Uh, he published it himself at first, and then it was... Uh, I'm wanting to say California Pacific, uh, something like that. Uh, I'm not actually sure how many copies of this are out there, but uh, man, if you got a copy of this game, good for you. I would uh, put it in a vault somewhere, safe deposit box, because uh, this is true collectible stuff. All right, anyway, uh, we start off here. We put in our lucky number, which I <laughs> was 666, the number of the beast. <laughs> I mean, what else are you going to put in for a lucky number, right? Uh, but the reason that's important, this game actually generates its own dungeons. I mean, this is a procedural generation. Uh, of, you know, what is this, 1980? Uh, maybe even before that. So really advanced stuff for the time. Uh, granted, these aren't going to be uh, amazing dungeons to explore or anything. But uh, again, I like to think about this game more as just histor the history of it. The, uh, thinking about what it was like back in 1980. You bought this Apple II. Most stuff is text-based. Uh, this is a lot more ambitious of a project. Uh, you know, what would, what would you have felt like in 1980 coming home with this game and, and putting it in, loading it, uh, especially if you were a Dungeons & Dragons nut? I and mean, this would have been really, really exciting stuff. But Anyway, let's just get into this. And I'm not an expert at the game, at this game by any means. Uh, Obviously, some of you guys have probably have played this enough to have all these commands memorized. Uh, I'm going with what I read in the manual and a few uh, hint, hint sites, sort of tip, general tips and suggestions uh, that I've come across here. But uh, anyway, the first screen here is just simply buying items. And one of the things the manual <laughs> goes into depth about, actually, very short. I mean, I don't even know if you call it a manual, more like a manualette, <laughs> instruction card maybe. Uh, but it says, buy food. Uh, you will starve to death unless you buy food. And as you'll see, that turned out to be pretty good advice. I, I don't know if you should spend all your money on food, but uh, you definitely want to uh, uh, pack a few extra extra boxes of Twinkies, you know, get a couple of uh, boxes of Ding Dongs, get some beef jerky, some Slim Jims, uh, whatever uh, you can fit in because you will be going through this food uh, really quickly. And also, I don't think just, oh, I'll just buy the one axe, the, the one shield, because uh, one of the things you'll see happening here is this stuff gets stolen all the time. Uh, there's thieves uh, that come around and swipe your gear, and you can, if you don't have an extra, 
uh, you're screwed. Uh, that said, you can sometimes find chests and things, and uh, I don't know if loot drops off monsters necessarily, but uh, uh, you can replenish uh, some of that. Now, I said that I should go back, I should go to the uh, castle of the mighty Lord British here. He's going to give us our quest. He'll be giving us promotions when we uh, achieve these quests. <laughs> what is thy name, peasant? <laughs> Doest Doest thou wish for grand adventure? Hell yes, of course. <laughs> well, good. Uh, thou shalt try to become a knight. And so we got to go find a gremlin. Now, the backstory here is this guy named Mondane, evil wizard, whatever, uh, re wreaked havoc across the countryside here. And uh, Lord British came around, stomped him, but uh, he's a little too busy doing his uh, king thing, I guess, his lord lording it over the rest of us. <laughs> Uh, so he's hired us out or commissioned us to go into these dungeons and finish off the rest of the miscreants that are lurking in these dark, dank corridors. <laughs> and they're pretty tough. They're going to kick our ass. I mean, uh, this is on level difficulty one. <laughs> it's very tough. Uh, so anyway, we're you got this overland map here uh, to start off with the... Uh, you can see that sort of square, those four squares. I don't know what how to describe that symbol. Looks like something off of... I think I've seen that on like a dog food. <laughs> Back of dog food, that symbol. And uh, I'm looking here at the lower right corner there. Uh, that is a, like a town or castle. Uh, but what we want to find is an X. And once we fi found uh, find that X, that'll be our first dungeon. And then we can start looking for this uh, uh, this gremlin. Now the way you move around here is a little funky. Uh, I don't know what what's going on here. It seemed like the first time I played this I could just use the arrow keys, but uh, now I'm having to type E for east and W for west and for whatever reason enter to go up. <laughs> and uh, I want to say a question mark or a less than sign to go down. I mean really bizarre. And I don't, you know, again, they this is probably the emulator, some setting somewhere you could change this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, just try to figure it out. So I'm looking for an X somewhere, and you notice that food ticker there in the lower right corner is just ticking down, ticking down. Every step, I think, takes a full uh, uh, food number. Let's see, what am I? <laughs> South. <laughs> okay, there we go. Yeah, I think it's the less than symbol. Uh, really tricky. One of the things about these old games is you, you don't really appreciate how great it is to have these user-friendly uh, interfaces, all the in-game hints and the, the tool tips and all this stuff. It can just kind of remind you of like what to press and, and how to get around. I mean, t tutorials, uh, you name it. This is before all of that. I mean, this is back, <laughs> I mean, you're looking at it. <laughs> hey, sucker, you know, you, you're going to have to figure all this out on your own. If you can't figure it out, then, then, then screw you. <laughs> I better go ask a friend. Uh, it might not even be in the manual uh, what you need to know. All right, so we're in, going into the dungeon, and now you see the shift here. Uh, so this is a big deal. You know, we went from that overland view, uh, which isn't really all that impressive. Uh, but now we get this 3D uh, sort of first per Oh, and there we go. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Look at that. Giant rat. Thank you, Richard Garriott. You know, man, the, the guy knew. I mean, there's a reason this guy's a legend. He came right away. There we go. Giant rat. All right, I'm attacking. And I, let's see, what do I do? You hit attack, then ask you what weapon. you got to remember A for axe, uh, I think R for rapier. Uh, you can even do uh, ranged attacks in this game. Sometimes you'll see the monsters will be kind of off in the distance, and you can uh, you know, throw something at them or use your bow. Well, I think this guy's right up close. I mean, that's not a bad-looking rat either. I mean, if you look at that thing, it's, it's looks pretty demonic. All right, got it. Killed it. I uh, got four pieces of eight. <laughs> now, now, granted, he almost killed me. I'm down to seven hit points there, so I'm probably pretty screwed. Uh, I think the only way you can get hit points back is actually to leave the dungeon and go talk to uh, Lord British again. So I'm probably screwed on that. But, you know, again, this is a different era of uh, video game history. You know, at, at this point, I don't, you know, it wasn't such a big deal to beat the game. Uh, to complete the game. It was more about just playing it. Uh, people didn't get so upset when they died uh, and started over again. Uh, I mean, it seems weird to hear that, but I mean, it was. I remember these days. 
you know, you're just a kid. You're just sitting there in front of the keyboard. You're having fun. You're playing this, trying to figure it out <laughs> the best you can. I mean, just the very act of playing a game uh, was awesome. Uh, you didn't worry so much about, well, how do I, you know, you know oh, I died. Oh, rage quit. <laughs> you didn't, at least for me, it wasn't anything like that. All right, killed that thief. I think he took some of my uh, some of my items. I think he took an axe or something. Uh, so anyway, this is pretty much the game, uh, believe it or not. Uh, a few other little things. Uh, we get chests. There's ladders to go up and down. Not sure what the heck I'm looking at there. What is that little square on the floor? It's like a pit to me. Uh, I'm pretty sure that since I put it on level difficulty one, that's why we're not getting uh, attacked all the time. But uh, what, what, what we're trying to do here, if you remember, is to find a gremlin. And my guess is he's probably not going to be hanging out here on the first floor. He's probably going to be deep down one of the uh, lower levels of the dungeon. Uh, but again, you know, it, it's curious to look at something like this. And it's, uh, I mean, we're so sort of... Uh, spoiled I guess with all the graphics and the you know the audio visuals the big epic storylines and, and all this stuff but trying to you know if, if you can sort of block all that from your memory and just imagine that you know maybe you'd never played a, a game before video game or the, maybe you'd only played stuff at the arcades now you got this Apple II at home uh, most of your other games are uh, just nothing but text now here's this thing with the uh, you know, this wire perspective, I mean, this must have felt immersive as hell. You, know, you imagine the lights off. Maybe you got some uh, heavy metal playing, hopefully a little Iron Maiden in the background. <laughs> Just kind of wandering these dungeons, wondering when you're going to get killed. If you can make it back to, back to the first floor, Lord British. And again, uh, these dungeons are all procedurally generated, so you could map it, I suppose, but... You know, if you play it again, you put in a different number, you're going to have a whole different layout. So uh, you, there's not a walkthrough or a guide, a map guide, something like that you could have got on to uh, make this easy for you. Uh, but again, I think we've probably seen about as much <laughs> as I need to show you here. Uh, I'm really, you know, it's, it's so easy. Uh, what I want to try to get you away from is this idea of just dismissing this. Like, well, it's an old, obsolete game. Uh, who cares? You know, it's uh, he went on to make Ultima, isn't that? <laughs> who cares about this earlier game? But you know, I don't think you should do that. You know, take a look. You know, play something like this. Oh, there we're going down to level two, and try to put yourself back in that mindset of uh, 1980. Uh, what 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 would it have felt like to play something like this? And you think about all the the impact it had. You know, when we look at Wizardry next time, I uh, won't cover that in this episode, but. Uh, you'll see a similar sort of perspective here. And Garriott, though, as far as I know, he didn't play any of those Plato games you know, like the Wizardry guys did. And this was just all his own creation. Just kind of come up with this. Of course, he played Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, but you know, it wasn't like he had anybody to copy or imitate. He just had to <laughs> create his own system. And I think he, what was he like, uh, in his 20s maybe when he was doing this? You know, I tell you the truth, uh, working with BASIC, I don't think I could make this today. You know, if I was, uh, if you just gave me an Apple II and an Apple BASIC and maybe the uh, that, that BASIC programmer's guide, and <laughs> could you make this? I mean, you, some of you guys probably could, but I would just, I wouldn't even know where to get started. You know, it certainly wasn't, uh, you know, just like this game, the games back then, the programming wasn't hold your hand. Uh, a lot of it was trial and error error you you figure it out if you can't figure it out then <laughs> tough luck it wasn't like you could just hop on the internet and uh, get some uh, get some help all right anyway that's that'll do it for Calibeth. let's take a look at another game here and i'm gonna stick with the apple II. we'll cover the apple twos and i'll show you one for the for dos uh but let's uh, move on here and here we go with another one another apple II game from around the same time you know, again, I, one of the things I talk about in the book is how hard it is sometimes to nail down exactly when this stuff comes out. Lots of reasons why you can't necessarily trust uh, <clears throat> what you see in the game or within the manuals as far as copyrights and 
and uh, dates. Uh, but this is a very interesting game. It's, uh, I guess it's, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it. Emon, Eamon, Amon, uh, Eamon, who knows. Uh, but this was a public domain game. And the cool thing was uh, that anybody could create modules for this. They actually released a, uh, a program that would let you create your own uh, stories and dungeons. So there's a lot of user-generated content, uh, a ton of it actually. Uh, again, really cool for this uh, for this era. Uh, but we're playing around with this. You can see there's a lot of, this will be completely text-based. There's no uh, effort at the graphics um, like we saw with the Calibeth, but I was having a lot of fun with the text. I'm very descriptive. You know, uh, one of the games that you might have played if you're from this time or grew up in the early 80s, uh, there were games called Text Adventures. You had Zork, it's one of my favorites. You had Planetfall, uh, Infocom games. And, and so it wasn't like people would look at a text game and, and think it was crap. You know, actually, about this, uh, games like Zork were best selling, you know, huge hits. Uh, and that was right about the time this, this would have come out. Uh, so basically, graphics were considered kind of a cutting edge thing, a big plus. If you didn't have it, though, it wasn't necessarily a deal breaker. I'm kind of going on like this just so you wouldn't, again, try to think about yourself early 1980s looking at this. You wouldn't have looked at this and thought, wow, that's that's horribly primitive. <laughs> uh, you would have looked at it and probably thought, wow, cool. You know, we've got lots of uh, descriptive text, pretty good writing. Everything's <laughs> grammatically correct. <laughs> this, the spelling is good. I mean, I don't know what kind of thought uh, you would have had. But, uh, I mean, just, uh, just look at the system. I mean, we've got lots of uh, pretty detailed information here about uh, hit chances and odds, uh, adjustments made by armor. So if you look at that plate armor there, it's going to give us a 60% less likely chance of hitting. <laughs> and that's another twist there, if you can read that. I'm kind of going quickly here, but it's not going to tell us exactly how much damage we've taken or how much health we have left. It keeps it pretty uh, general. Again, trying to stay in this mindset of a role-playing game, a tabletop game. Uh, uh, suspending the disbelief, I suppose. So it's just going to say, wow, you're, that one hurt. You don't feel well. <laughs> say that instead of, well, you have four out of 13 hit points left. Uh, so they want to kind of keep you in the fantasy a little bit more, try to not, they don't want you thinking so much about the percentages all the time, uh, the, the math involved here. All right, more information, lots of info here. Uh, a little bit more detailed, I think, than uh, with the Calabeth. Uh, but there's still lots to learn. See, blast, hurl your enemies from a dis hurt your enemies from a distance, heal. Those are spells you can get. Uh, I noticed there were some men drinking in this guild. I <laughs> kind of wondering if I should have just went with that option instead. Okay, six options. Uh, examine abilities. Go to a bank. Hire this wizard. Teach us some spells. Let's go, of course go to Marcus Caviele, the owner. The uh, <laughs> arm shop <laughs> well as i live in as i live in breath as i live and breathe uh, breath <laughs> okay if it isn't my old pal matt uh, so you want to buy a weapon sell the weapon or get some better armor you know it's authentic because they got that you and armor that just makes it really authentic man i'm so immersed <laughs> uh, let's see he's got three axes Varying quality. Very good one, a fair one, and a kind of shabby one. Probably can only afford the shabby, but let's, let's, let's just see if we can get the uh, uh, the fair one. Looks like we, we can. Try to get some armor now. I don't give credit. I guess Marcos, he's, he's probably got an Italian accent, right? Um, I don't... <laughs> I'm not very good at those. <laughs> I don't give no credit. Uh, let's see what we got. Uh, probably should get at least some leather armor. Okay, old armor. You know, and again, uh, I can distinctly remember playing games like this uh, back in the day. And it's just being a kid, the, the fun, it was so much fun just creating the character, buying the gear, uh, starting out. And you, you, you knew you probably weren't going to last very long. Uh, that didn't matter. Okay, what do we have here? Beginner's Cave and the disk drive in, in slot 6. <laughs> the beginner's cave. <laughs> well, at least these guys, uh, who's this, Donald Brown, I think? 
you know, they do have this beginner's cave set up, so hopefully this will give us a chance to, to learn the basics before we get slaughtered. Beginners only. A local knight marshal comes out to inspect you, says you may now proceed. Huh, I wonder, he probably would uh, send you back if you didn't buy any armor, maybe. Let's see, beginners only. To the north is the road back to town. Uh, so very, it, it's very reminiscent to me of games like Zork. You just type in like S for South or W for West. Looking at the room descriptions there. I don't know if this is if there's puzzles in this game or not, but mainly just looking to see if there's objects in here, maybe where some monsters are. Just kind of exploring. <laughs> <laughs> and yes here we go got lucky again black rat brown rat brown rat tan rat man this is the first time i've ever seen a tan rat i mean that thing has been in the he's been sunbathing he's been in the tanning bed he is <laughs> nice and nice orange uh complexion on this thing man i'm just in heaven here uh, attacking rats and there's diamonds. <laughs> I don't know what what these rats are doing with diamonds. Uh, uh, but hey. Alright, just attacking the rats. And I, I'm, I'm typing out attack rat here like, a, like an idiot. I found out that you can just hit enter. And it'll just repeat the same command over again. So you don't have to keep typing that out. But uh, What the heck. Okay, got some diamonds. Not a bad reward for killing some rats. I think killing rats is its own reward. Uh, but it doesn't hurt to have a little... Uh, a few diamonds for your trouble, right? Uh, <laughs> you can also notice... I don't know if you noticed this, but it let me pick up that rat's corpse. Now, what do you do with a rat corpse? Uh, I don't know. Is it a collect collector's item? <laughs> it's that tan one. It's that, it's that tan rat, too. <laughs> yeah, I'm holding on to that sucker. Yeah, there's those other rats. These, these guys flee, fled... Now they, they'd rather flee than bleed. Fled than bled. There's got to be a rhyme in there somewhere. Just attacking rats. and I think I got them all. I keep, I keep running away. All right, what do we have here? A grizzled old hermit who smells as if he hasn't taken a bath in 40, in 40 years. Wow. There's a bottle here with a strange potion inside. Well, what kind of bottle would this old stinky Herman have on him? <laughs> Find out. Attack, Herman, or, or Hermit. This guy's really kind of hard to hit. Man, I can't imagine if I had the plate mail. I mean, it'd be impossible to hit. Now, these skills do uh, level up as you use them, it said in the instructions. So every time I hit, I get a little bit better up to a certain point. I think the armor is a similar system. So actually a pretty sophisticated uh, system here. So probably uh, more sophisticated than a Calabeth. And just in terms of the role-playing mechanics at work here. <laughs> oh, Matt is at death's door. Knocking loudly. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, let me in or maybe don't let me in. Uh, man, this, this hermit is something else. Hermit is in pain. Okay. It's like I'm starting to uh, hold my own here. There we go. Hermit is dead. Yeah, see, we see an axe with a pound sign. That probably means it's enchanted. Get that bottle. Go ahead and drink that bottle. Some of your wounds seem to clear up. You feel better. Well, there we go. It's a healing potion. <laughs> what else do you think that old hermit would have on him? I was kind of hoping for ale, to be honest with you. But I'll settle for that healing potion. That medicinal brew, that tonic. <laughs> you know, most tonics are mostly alcohol anyway. Okay, let's see. How do I, uh, like, wield uh, uh, this, this magic axe? Got to be a command there somewhere. At least they're kind enough here to list them out for me. That's, that's cool. Let's see. It doesn't... Uh, examine didn't work. What command? Uh, smile. That's kind of interesting. There we go. Ready. It's kind of like uh, the gold box game. Seems like you ready stuff in those too. I don't know if this comes from D&D &D or what. 
Okay, it's readied. So I have the axe with the pound sign next to it. <laughs> I guess I, just try it out on this uh, brown rat. Come on. He's still there. Got him. Got him. All right, so man, what an awesome game. Already killed three rats <laughs> with an axe and a magic. Got a magic axe. I mean, killed a hermit. Uh, I mean, what, what more could you ask for here? Let's see. Maybe I should drop some of these corpses, though. <laughs> drop the dead hermit. <laughs> Are you supposed to bury them? I, I don't know. You know, it's one of the problems, especially with these old, old games. I mean, even you can get online sometimes you can't find answers to these things. I mean, nobody's really played them. Maybe nobody ever knew. So sometimes you just can't get answers to these questions. There's got to be some reason. Well, maybe there, maybe there's just nothing there. Maybe there's no reason. Maybe it just so happens you can pick up the corpse. Uh, maybe they're just seeing. Maybe uh, maybe you got a weight limit. Uh, maybe you could eat the. I kept thinking maybe you had to eat the, <laughs> cook them at some point if you starve. <laughs> okay, but anyway, you should probably get the idea here with this one. Uh, this to me feels a lot like uh, one of those text adventure games. You know, there's a lot of exploration, a lot of. Uh, you know, I don't think this is procedurally generated, so you could actually map this out and come back to it and. Uh, what do we have here? A man with a beard and a brass ring wearing clothes made out of silk and wielding a very fancily engraved sword. It's like there's a large pile of jewels there, too. And uh, uh, a bright green flame surrounding the blade of his sword. So he's probably, gonna, probably going to kill me, but what? <laughs> she killed him. <laughs> wow, so it looks like now I've got a magic sword. How awesome is that? <laughs> I see no sword here. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's, that's the, you know, the, the funny thing with these text adventures, it'll say something like, you see a sword. And you say, get the sword. And it's like, I don't know what's, what sword? What's, what's the sword you're talking about? <laughs> you just said there's a sword. Oh, guys, it's just it's that kind of thing over and over. And, uh, of course, it's, uh, I have to type in the name of the sword. Trolls Fire. You know, it's just one of the one of the things about gaming at this point. You know, especially these text adventure games. I mean, they just drive you nuts. Uh, you know, about half the game is just trying to figure out why do I how do I word this? <laughs> what exactly do I have to type in uh, to get this thing to understand what I'm trying to to say? You know, I mean, that's one of the reasons why those Infocom games, I guess, were popular. Now they're a little bit more flexible. Uh, you you know, I guess you could just say. <laughs> get all or whatever and it would just get it uh, but even with those i remember quite often having to really struggle with this this parser so i certainly don't miss this aspect uh, of the of the bronze age i mean anyway, i think that's enough of this one aemon uh the really as i said the awesome thing about this isn't so much the interface here although that's cool it's that uh you could make your own modules for it and there's just tons and tons of them i think people might still be making content for this game i mean it's really on that level and of course it's public domain so people could freely uh, share this around and again that would be that would have been really awesome too back in the day uh, you know maybe you don't want to learn basic or whatever uh, you could use something like this to make some games for your friends uh, if you got some role-playing buddies you know you could put them in the game too have them as uh, put them in there somehow uh, you, whatever world you created you could uh, put that into the games oh there's a mimic well, let's go ahead and kill this mimic before we go. Uh, so again, really awesome stuff. Um, there's a ring underneath that. <laughs> Get the ring. <laughs> you know, the amazing thing to me uh, making this video and going back and looking at these games is, like, even right at the very beginning, I mean, I mean, hardly anybody even had a home computer. I mean, it was a big deal. You know, they even had to, they called them home computers because, uh, you know, uh, you know, at the time, uh, there were mainframe computers. There were these, they called mini computers. Uh, and all that stuff was way too expensive for just the average person. You know, these were like, they might have one at your factory or your uh, university would have them, of course, government labs or whatever. Uh, but you certainly wouldn't have them at home uh, until this, this home computer started to come out. And you'd have, uh, you know, games like this for it. But uh, very, uh, very few people had them. So it's really... <laughs> <laughs> a, a world of pioneers. 
Okay, let's uh, switch over. I'll look at one last Apple II one, and it's a terrible one, but we will take a look. All right, so here we go with the Tarturian. And I wouldn't even have known about this game, but uh, John Romero, you guys know him, one of the creators of Doom, uh, wrote about this game on Moby Games. I came across it there. He wrote the description of it. So I guess it's something he played back in the day. Uh, definitely hasn't held up well, but there's a few little interesting things about it. Uh, one is that instead of creating, instead of controlling one guy, uh, you have this big army, like ten gladiators, ten wizards, ten elves, and so on. And each one of those classes has certain things it can do, uh, like the cleric can translate, decipher, read things. Uh, the wizard, I think, can cast spells. The fighter, uh, or the, uh, the the gladiator, has some fighting abilities, and, and strong man, <laughs> strong men can break boxes and so on. Uh, it's really more of a, uh, just to, to my mind, a really poorly done graphical adventure game uh, with some role playing elements to it. Uh, I, for the love of God, I cannot figure out how combat's supposed to work. Uh, they got the gladiator. He's got these abilities to kill, to fight, to attack. Every time I tried those, though, none of it worked. So I don't know if it's just automatic or you're just supposed to run away from the bad guys. Uh, you have to find a weapon first. I don't know. Uh, the cleric there can listen and they're... <laughs> Uh, I just remember playing some of these old graphical adventure games like this, and, and the big problem is that the graphics don't really fit the text very well, or the how to how to say this. I mean, so you'd be looking at a screen, it looks like you can go north, uh, but it'll say you can't go north, or it looks like you can go west, can't go west. So you can't trust what it is you're looking at. Uh, that's a problem. Um, uh, but really, it's just the. the the, how counterintuitive everything is. <laughs> uh, wow, this is just truly terrible. And, you know, cool, uh, you know, fine. This is early 80s, early days. Uh, you know, this, this game was commercially published, believe it or not. Uh, the manual's fairly decent, but I guess this is pretty much what you could expect to see back, back in the day. Uh, obviously, we've come a long, long ways. Uh, and every another problem is every time you change character classes, you lose some strength. You can only do that so many times before you die. So I don't know what the hell's going on with this one. You know, <laughs> it's just bad. <laughs> what do you want me to say? Uh, the Tartarian uh, crap game. You know, I'll go on record with that. Uh, some uh, the, the basic idea I don't think is that bad. It just. Uh, it's just painful. <laughs> yeah, this is like Pool of Radiance Ruins of Myth Draenor of its time. Uh, what the hell is that thing? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, Warlock's power imprisoned me. I don't know what it is I'm supposed to be looking at there. What is that? Catac c coffins? Caskets? Tombs. Uh. <laughs> Man, I feel so bad for a kid that would have like spent his money selling newspapers or whatever, S selling grit. Uh, I don't know. End up with this thing. <laughs> I think I've been, been even sadder if you're actually impressed with this. Uh, that is warlock writing. Okay, uh, let's see. Can we read? <laughs> of course, you, why would you be able to read it? Oh, oh. Uh, something happened. Oh, Woochie. <laughs> Woochie. <laughs> Woochie. <laughs> oh, this is probably magic words. Uh, I don't know. I, I really don't care. <laughs> it's uh, Woochie. <laughs> Woochie, Woochie. Woochie. Money well spent, man. I... <laughs> what are you doing, son? Well, I'm Woochie. Dad, come on. Don't you get it? Why can't I kill this damn thing? It's... Oh, what is going on now? What what is this? There's that Thule sweep. It's it's scared of people. <laughs> yeah, so I found all kinds of spelling errors in this. You know, I have no idea. Actually, I'm gonna look up who created this thing real quick.
Okay, so I've been searching for this. It's not in the manual or anywhere, but uh, it was published by Highlands Computer Services. <laughs> oh man, what now? Slave traders! Oh god, it just took my clerics. Uh, anyway, it says uh, here on Moby Games, this company was started by Butch Greathouse and Gary Reinhardt in the early 80s. They released five adventure games and a few other utilities. And I don't Looks like this is the only game Gary Reinhardt's credited with and Butch Greathouse, so <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, okay, I've been a little harsh on this. I mean, it was one of the very first computer role-playing games ever, so I guess we need to cut them some slack. And again, people back then, they didn't really have a lot to compare it to. Uh, you might have thought, well, this is just what computer games are like. You know, you have to kind of... <laughs> uh, you know, again, you wouldn't have anything to compare it to necessarily, so you might think this is awesome. Like, wow, look at those stalagmites and stalactites, and uh, wow, there's a <laughs> a strong box. <laughs> like, it's a, it's a box. <laughs> it's a box. <laughs> you know? Oh my! Snake attack! Freaking snake attack! Come on! <laughs> ow, 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 ow. <laughs> you know, it doesn't seem to be hurting me though. I don't know, man. Can I do anything to this box? <laughs> Useless gladiator. Come on. You can't just jab your gladius there inside that box. Good God. You're too weak to continue. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so this is the last of these Bronze Age games I want to look at today. Maybe look at some more next time. Uh, this is Wizard's Castle. And this was done by a guy named Joseph... Uh, let's see, what's his name? Joseph uh, R. Power. And we're looking here at the DOS version, but believe it or not, this thing actually launched on the Exidy Sorcerer. Now, if you've got... If you if you had one of those, man, I, I would like to talk to you because that is one heck of an obscure platform. You don't really ever hear about it. Uh, but it did exist, and apparently this is the Wizard's Castle. Joseph made it for that, but he did it in basic, so it wasn't any big deal. You know, all the different kinds of basics are basic. <laughs> basics are basically basic. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could just, uh, you know, you might have to change a few, few lines around, but you could put it on another system as long as it had basic, and just about every one of these early machines had some form of basic. Uh, so this is the DOS version. And this is actually a lot more playable than the other one, <laughs> that Tartarian thing. <laughs> uh, it is only text. There is a map you can look at, which is pretty cool. Uh, but, you know, a lot of this stuff, again, it's, it's pretty sophisticated stuff. You've got your stats. You can allocate these points uh, the way you want to. You've got armor choices. It doesn't spell out uh, the difference uh, between these types, but since it's in basic, if you wanted to, you could go and look at the source code and figure it out or... I guess there's probably a manual. I haven't looked at the manual for this in a while. Just kind of going by uh, instinct. <laughs> we'll see how far uh, that takes me. All right, and again, with the very uh, adventure game-like interface, you just type in where you want to go, east, west. It looks like this one has a coordinate system there. It says you are at 3, 5. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I found a book. Uh, can't get it. I guess that's a code word for gaze. G, probably. Uh, bat flew by. Okay, I got the manual pulled up here. Let's see what I can do with a book. What do you, what can you do with a book? <laughs> you can't read it, apparently. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, contents of room. Help, down, gaze, north, drink, teleport, map, flare. Uh, yes, I like to flare now. Uh, lamp, west, up, open. Uh, pretty esoteric. Crystal orb. Avoid <laughs> ruby red. Avoid lethargy. Green gem. Avoid forgetting. Blue flame dissolves books. <laughs> Silly dwarf. That wasn't a valid command. You, know, you don't have a lamp, dwarf. Oh God, what do I do with a damn book? Uh, bear attacks. All right, here we go. We are being attacked by a bear. Not as good as a rat, but I'll take it. All right. At least we can attack this. 
thing we missed, but... Ouch, he hit you. Um, your strength is 11. Your dexterity is 9. Uh, let's see. I hit him that time. I hit him. It's an evil bear now. Hit the evil bear. Uh, this is not a, This is not the Teddy Graham. This is not sugar. <laughs> the sugar bear here. <laughs> Although some parents might argue that he was evil. That's easy. Yeah, he's dead. Got me a nice uh, bearskin rug out of it. A hoard of gold. <laughs> yeah so this one uh you know this is playable oh there's the map all right so i guess you could look at that and see well there's the book there's the the g whatever that is you smell an ogre frying you smell an ogre frying so is, is the ogre <laughs> making some eggs over there or is he on fire uh, uh, Silmaril Palantir. Yeah, you can tell Joseph, I guess, was a big Tolkien fan. A lot of these guys like to show off their knowledge of the more obscure aspects of Tolkien. You know, oh, they were the Silmarillion. <laughs> you newbie. All you've seen is the movies. They had the... Remember those movies? Not the, not the Peter Jackson ones. You remember those, those older ones? The, the cartoons? Animated ones? <laughs> I'm not sure when those came out. Uh, let's see. Trade with attack. Ignore the vendor. You're too poor to trade more. Anyway, I think you get the idea with this one too. Wizard's Castle. Uh, so there's your little overview of some of the games of the Bronze Age. You can obviously, you probably don't want to, <clears throat> you're probably not jonesing to go play these things today. Uh, but I think it gives you some appreciation, though, of uh, the games to come. You know, we started off looking at a Calabeth. I mean, Gary, it would uh, take a huge leap forward with the next game we'll look at in a couple episodes from now called uh, Ultima, of course. <laughs> you just, uh, I mean, Ultima 1, Ultima 2, Ultima 3, he's just making huge strides with those, really just bringing the whole industry with them. Uh, we'll also, uh, on the horizon, Wizardry, another very playable game. Actually, that one holds up really, really well. You could still play that. Uh, but, you know, there you go. It's kind of unfair to try to rate these games. I would just, I think it's safe to say you probably wouldn't want to play any of these <laughs> unless you were really nostalgic or you just wanted to experience the pain uh, to give you a better appreciation for the uh, accomplishments later on in this era. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you want to learn more about these games, they're, they're easy to find. Uh, I just go to Virtual Apple or, or just search for them. On Google, you could find them pretty easily. Set up an emulator and, and go at it. Uh, but anyway, I'll leave it there. If you have questions, comments, whatever, love to hear it. And see you next time. And that's all this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Hopefully be back uh, uh, next week uh, Next week for part two of the Bronze Age, and then we'll look at the Silver Age. And I'm going to try to go through all the different ages with you. Uh, look at, I don't know, probably won't cover all the games, obviously, but try to hit the highlights. I think you'll uh, like this series, and it should be a lot of fun uh, to watch. And uh, also, maybe you can even track down some of these games, play them, or you might actually remember some of these from, uh, you know, back in the day. Uh, if so, I'd love to hear your take, uh, what your thoughts are, sort of back then, and, you know, how well you think the game holds up, what aspects about it. Uh, sort of stuck with you. Love to hear all that. And you can just post those in the comments. Really appreciate it. Uh, as always, I want to thank you, 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 thank you so very, very much for supporting this show, supporting Match Hat, keeping these episodes coming, uh, keeping this channel alive. Could not do it without you. Zero percent chance of that happening uh, without your uh, personal support. Uh, so remember, guys, there's no ads here. There's no uh, sponsors, no uh, publishers, nothing like that. Uh, it's just guys and uh, gals like you stepping up, uh, supporting the show. One buck per episode, all I ask. And uh, really, just really, truly appreciate your help. I uh, also want to mention, I got a bunch of these uh, Matt Chat coins left. Uh, I don't know how many, I might have as many as 50 of these left. Uh, so if you have donated up to 100 bucks or $100 or more to the show over the years, uh, just let me know uh, if, you have, if, you, if you haven't gotten a coin yet, that is. Uh, so just what you need to do basically is uh, either text or email me. Tell me what your address is. Uh, I want to make sure we're 100% on that because I've actually had a few of these come back. 
because uh, uh, the, uh, the addresses were wrong. Uh, so I definitely want to verify your address, but I, you know, I'd love to, for you guys to have these coins. You know, they're not doing me any good sitting here, and I think you would uh, uh, get a lot out of them. So uh, just let me know. Again, 100 bucks or more. What's your address, and I will ship you one of these coins. All right, uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? quite a bit of news it has been a few weeks since the last episode so it tends to pile up uh first up is a couple items from good old stig uh first is concerning a game called generation zero uh there's a announcement there's an announcement trailer out for this now this is a uh, they describe this as an explosive game of cat and mouse set in a vast open world in this uh, reimagining of 1980s sweden hostile machines have invaded the countryside and you need to fight back Go alone or team up with up to three friends in seamless co-op. Utilize battle-tested guerrilla tactics, lure, cripple, or destroy enemies in intense creative sandbox skirmishes. As I really like the aesthetic on this, you should definitely check out this trailer. The, the, the music, uh, to me, really stands out. They were kind of going through this sort of 80s revival thing right now with Cobra Kai and all this stuff. So, you know, I think this game will pique your interest. Uh, Stig also wrote in about Gunman Tales. Uh, this is a new game inspired by Cabal and uh, Moonstone. If you remember that from back in the uh, Amiga days. Uh, this is an early access. It's an old school action adventure game for one to four players against gunmen and werewolves set in a wild west inspired uh, by Moonstone and Cabal. Uh, you must find the legendary lost treasure, explore the lands to find the four pieces of the map before the other gunmen, which will give you access into the Golden Valley. Uh, so this one looks pretty cool, kind of a retro vibe to it, uh, pixel art and so on. Uh, so anyway, if you like Cabal and Moonstone, you definitely uh, should check that out. Uh, Shane wrote in about this, a lot of been talking about Fallout lately. Uh, well, this is not about uh, that, that other game. Uh, this is Fallout the Frontier. And what this is, is a um, unofficial expansion or a mod for Fallout New Vegas. Uh, this one has you heading out into the frozen north to aid new California Republic deserters in a massive new map. And this is as, as big a map as they can create uh, with the editor tools. Uh, the Frontier has been in development for years and it's apparently now in the final stages of development. Uh, so definitely go check this, uh, that out. I know a lot of you guys uh, love the New Vegas. It's probably, you know, <laughs> uh, to me you're just never going to beat Fallout 2 is my favorite. Uh, but, you know, New Vegas was certainly a good one, and this se seems like a really good expansion. It's always fun when the, uh, these unofficial expansions turn out to be better than the uh, official release, uh, you know, whatever the uh, Bethesda's up to. So, uh, anyway, go check that out. And then a couple of last items here that I uh, come across. So, this first one, I don't know what to make of this. It's called Man Eater. It's Jaws meets <laughs> role-playing games meets a revenge quest. Uh, so you get to play as a shark in this game. You're leveling up. You're getting better at eating spring breakers. <laughs> Variety. It's of a stat-driven system. Apparently the role-playing mechanics on this are actually pretty <laughs> in-depth. Uh, evolve different parts of your body to improve how they function or pump up your ferocity to enter brief feeding frenzies. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if this is just a gimmick or this might turn out to be a really fun game, but uh, definitely check this out. It's called Man Eater. And then uh, finally, the Witcher 3 guys, uh, CD Projekt Red, they've uh, announced their latest project. It's Cyberpunk 2077. And this takes place in an alternate reality version of Northern California. It's a sprawling megacity filled with augmented humans. And apparently this is based on a pen and paper game called Cyberpunk tw uh, 2020. And I haven't played that, but uh, to me, I guess this kind of fits in with all the uh, interest in Blade Runner, that new Blade Runner film, uh, the Shadowrun stuff. So... Uh, anyway, if you're tired of that Witcher uh, world, I guess, uh, then you can check this out, uh, Cyberpunk 2077. All right, that will do it for the news. What about that ale of the week? All right, so I wanted to get something really special to start off this new historical series. Hope you guys are uh, looking forward to this as much as I am. I love delving into these old school uh, CRPGs. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but anyway, I wanted a good ale to go with this uh, theme, so I picked up this uh, Duvel, and I know a lot of you guys have recommended this. I've gotten two or three people saying, like, where, <laughs> you know, how can you not have uh, reviewed the Duvel yet? 
And I'm not even sure that's true. I might have reviewed this at some point. It's one of the great uh, Belgian ales of all time. You can get it pretty much any, uh, any reasonably sized uh, liquor store will have this. And it's, uh, I, I know I've had it before, but it's been many, many years. And I, I really don't remember it other than, than it being good. So we'll see how, uh, how it tastes today. It's uh, got Saz Saz and Styrian Golden Hops in it. It's 8.5% alcohol by volume. And apparently this is uh, brewed by the fourth generation of this particular Belgian family, the Mortgatz. And that's actually the name of uh, the town where this is brewed, too, Mortgat, uh, out of uh, Belgium, of course. Uh, anyway, um, what else is there? Uh, just a Best Buy date. Uh, anyway, really looking forward to this, so uh, <laughs> uh, let's get this uh, Duvel open and see what it's all about. Now, one of the things you really want to pay attention to with these uh, uh, Belgian ales is that the, uh, they're very, very active. I don't know if you can see this, but these bubbles are just like... <laughs> uh, just really coming up uh, like you wouldn't believe. I mean, it's really something to see. Uh, but the upshot of that is if you try to pour, uh, pour it in real quick, you're just going to make a big mess. So you really have to take it nice and slow. And see, I've actually poured that glass a couple of minutes ago, and it's still just... The, the, the foam is just rising. Uh, pour, so I poured that a little too quickly. So for the horn here, I'm going to be really, really slow with this. Again, you, you know, with something like this, you don't want to be chugging this. You know, this is something to really uh, to sip on and savor this. I uh, really, really enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, this is just kind of captivating, you know, that... Anyway, let's give this a taste. The uh, Duvel. Mm. God almighty. Man, this is... Uh, uh, really, really strong flavors on this. Almost like a champagne-like aroma to it. Uh, very creamy consistency. Very sweet. Very citrusy. Very uh, refreshing, actually. Really, really good. Um... I mean, with these, you don't taste any sort of alcoholic flavor, no bitterness. It's, uh, what I like about it, though, is it's sweet without being too sweet. You know, th these guys always nail it just right, so you really get the flavors of those, uh, of that malt and those, uh, those hops uh, without any one element just overpowering it. It's just a really good balance on this. I'm going to try it again. Uh. Yeah, I mean, just absolutely fantastic stuff. You know, if, if you guys have never tried uh, a Belgian ale, a genuine Belgian ale, I really don't think it could do worse than this uh, Duvel. You know, 8.5%, uh, so that's, you know, probably about twice the strength of your typical, uh, you know, Coors or something. Uh, but you don't taste the alcohol. I mean, it's not like one of these drinks where, you know, I dare you to drink this. <laughs> you know, nothing like that. It's actually very sweet, very smooth. Uh, you know, what can you say? It's like the perfect ale. I'll try it again here. Mm. Ah. Uh, just amazing stuff. You know, if I just had to choose one ale to drink, and I would never drink anything else, if I just kind of stuck with like one brand, one uh, or uh, one style, I would definitely go uh, maybe with the Duvel. I don't know. I know a lot of you guys have said this is the best. Uh, I'm kind of torn, actually. I, I love the Chimay's as well. I like the uh, the pirate or pirate ale. It's another one of my favorites. And there's a Japanese. Uh, it's like a white owl, like a Tashino. I can't get it here in Minnesota, unfortunately. Uh, but that one's right up there, too. Uh, but anyway, this Duvel is definitely a solid, solid choice. Definitely a full five out of five uh, drinking corns on that, no question. You know, if you're really just, uh, you don't want to mess around, <laughs> you want something great, and you don't mind, you know, three or four extra bucks or whatever to get something truly good, uh, go for this Duvel. You know, I'll say something now that I'm, you know, I've tried a lot of these American imitations and, you know, <laughs> Belgian style ales, uh, shall we? You know, you try all that, it just, they, they never get it right. There's just something about it. I don't know if it's the water or what, but I mean, you can just look at this thing. You know, it's just still just gushing where the bubbles are just, whoo. I mean, it's really just something to see. And that's been in that glass now for uh, probably a good five or six minutes. And it's still that, that active, so... Wow. <laughs> you know, Duvel, full five, five, uh, five out of five drinking horse, no question. Uh, get it and try it if you have it. I think you'd really, really like it. All right, so let's wrap it up with a quote. And, you know, I've been watching uh, 
uh, all this Father's Day stuff coming out today. Of course, it's Father's Day. You know, by the way, guys, if you have uh, kids, you know, I wish you a happy Father's Day. You know, why don't you spend some time uh, with them? Play some uh, RPGs with them, you know. I, I think some of my, I was just thinking today, I think some of my best memories, period, you know, like the most fun I've ever had was just playing uh, computer games with my dad uh, back when I was, you know, six, seven years old. We'd play all kinds of games, you know, Mule, uh, Ports of Call, and the Amiga Empire. Uh, what else do we play? You know, um, <laughs> I lose track of it all. Elite, or we played that. And it's just, you know, even today, you know, I think back, it's just such a fond memory. I just really, really love those uh, those times. Uh, so if you got some kids, you know, maybe they maybe they appreciate it at the time, maybe they don't. Uh, but I guarantee, if you spend some time playing uh, some games with them, they will uh, look back and will, uh, you know, it'll be a great memory for them. So do that. And also, you know, of course, don't forget to wish your own dad Happy Father's Day. Uh, no, I wish my dad Happy Father's Day. <laughs> I don't know if he watches this show or not, but uh, anyway, I was looking for quotes about Father's Day. And there's so many good ones. Uh, I thought I, and it's been like a while since I've done the match yet, so I thought I'd just do three. <laughs> so you get triple the quotes, but I think you'll like all of these. Uh, so the first one here is by Jerry Seinfeld. It goes something like this. You can tell what was the best year of your father's life because they seem to freeze that clothing style and write it out. <laughs> so I was thinking about that. Yeah, my dad, I think he's worn the same, the same type of clothes uh, since the, uh, I guess he must have been like 70s, uh, 70s fashion. <laughs> you know, but there's nothing wrong with that. Huh? All right, so this next quote is from Clarence Darrow. There's a Darrow, Darrow. Uh, anyway, it goes something like this. The first half of our lives is ruined by our parents. The second half by our children. <laughs> a little cynical. Uh, but it is my favorite one of all, and it's by the uh, one and only Rodney Dangerfield. It goes something like this. Me and my dad used to play tag. He'd drive. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and see you next week. Crazies. End of the month, they're out of food. <laughs> <laughs>